going to move on uh, to another uh, formalism for doing parsing. Remember last time we talked about constituency parsing that provided us, uh, given a sentence, a structure. And this structure was based on phrasal constituents. And um, we were kind of combining which uh, phrases uh, are connected together in a constituency parse tree. Today, we are going to uh, move forward with another grammar formalism. And that's going to be dependency formalism, where syntactic structure of a sentence is described solely in terms of directed binary grammatical relations between the words. So, for example, here we have a sentence, uh, the tabby cat scratched the couch. And uh, the main verb here is scratched. And very often we will use verb or predicate uh, interchangeably. And here uh, we can see that there is a dependency arc going from scratch to cat. So this is what we mean by when we say here that we are going to uh, describe binary grammatical relation between words. So between word scratch and cat, we have uh, this arc meaning they are connected. When we have an arc from one word to another, so these arcs are always going to be directed, therefore not symmetrical. Uh, the, the word where the arc goes from is called the head. And the word that the arc goes to, that is pointing to, is going to be called the dependent. Informally, you can think about the head as uh, the central organizing word. And uh, as dependent could be something like a modifier. So he uh, here, um, for example, when we have a connection later on, we'll see it, the cat and Tabby are going to be connected. Uh, that, you know, analogy with being a central word and a modifier might make more sense. So we have these arcs between words. And these arcs are also going to be labeled with grammatical relations, such as subject, object, noun, modifier, determiner, and others. So here we have an arc between scratch and cat, uh, which is labeled as a subject, which means that the word cat is the subject of the uh, head word, which is uh, the verb scratch. Here we have scratch again being the head, uh, head uh, word. And the pendant is couch, and couch is the object of the head word, which is scratched. Uh, we'll also have in a dependency parse tree, first of all, here now I have filled in the whole tree, uh, the whole dependency structure. So we have made all the arcs, and some words will have arcs between each other, and some will not, right? Um, we will also have something called root, and root node um, marks the root of the tree, and it will never have anything going into root, so it's always going to have just one arc that's pointing to something, and very often that's the main verb of the sentence or the predicate. Okay, so uh, let me stop here just to make sure that we understand that we have relation between words, that we show them by uh, drawing these directed arcs from one word to another, and that we call one word head and the other dependent. So, so far, that's all, like I said, and I'm sure there are some questions about like, how do we produce this or whatever else, but is are these terms we have laid out uh, clear for you? All right, assuming the answer, the silence means yes. Um, I want to uh, describe what are the differences between dependency versus constituency. Um, here on the left, we have um, represented a dependency parse tree of the sentence, I prefer the morning flight through Denver. I want to emphasize that this kind of showing of dependency parse tree is never what we actually do. This is just for the sake of me describing kind of putting it next to the constituency parse tree. When you do dependency parsing, you will also see, uh, see a graph or tree that looks like something like this, right? Um, however, uh, we made a dependency parse tree and we decided to um, uh, show it in a tree, a tree structure like this. And this is our constituency parse tree of the same sentence. First thing you might notice is that in dependency parse tree, we do not have nodes that correspond to the phrasal constituents, such as noun phrases or verb phrases. We don't have that anymore uh, over here. 
And that shouldn't surprise you because I started this lecture by saying we ditched that idea and embraced another idea, which is to look at the binary relations between two words. So phrases, which are combination of multiple words, become less um, important. You can also see that here in dependency tree, uh, the arguments of a verb are close to each other in this um, in this um, tree. Um, although in the sentence we have the flight being here, prefer being a little bit farther away, uh, and I being close to prefer. So prefer and the other argument flight are actually slightly far away from each other in a sentence, but in a tree they are right next to each other. This is not the case for constituency parsity, where flight is actually far away from its main verb, which is uh, prefer. So not illustrated here, but maybe since I mentioned before, where your mind might go to are languages like um, um, here, like if you had a language like German, where the verb can appear at the end of the a sentence, whereas the subject appears as the first word of a sentence, this becomes uh, much more, much nicer. Also not illustrated here, but I mentioned before that uh, idea of constituency, that some words that come one after the other and make a phrase uh, can behave as a function, might not work in other languages, specifically languages that allow more free order of words. Uh, because then those words that are actually connected grammatically will not be close to each other and not, will not form the phrase. So dependency parsing will make more sense for languages like that, which are like Russian or uh, Latin or other uh, free form languages, free order, uh, free word order languages. Okay, so we have seen some differences between dependency and constituency. And what are we going to talk about now is just making this um, post, uh, dependency part three a little bit more formal, like what is it? And uh, we'll talk about a data for dependencies that realizes one formalism. And then we'll move into two ways of uh, producing these parse trees. And for that, I'm gonna use uh, slides from Professor Vivek, but this time, I'll know how to <laughs> go over the examples. So we can define a dependency, uh, dependency structure as a, as a directed graph um, where we have a set of vertices being uh, words in English, for example, we might allow punctuation as well to be a vertex, uh, but in other languages that are morphologically rich by which we, by now we should all know that means that the words in that language uh, can be uh, inflected a lot. Uh, there we might also allow uh, affixes to be our vertices or steps. Uh, we will also have a set of labeled arcs, which are um, ordered pa pairs of vertices. So um, before, let's see one of the, <clears throat> here we have um, cat and tabby being um, connected by an arc. And the way we would represent uh, this arc is then as an ordered pair. Uh, and I believe that the head word will go first. So we will have cat, a comma, tabby would be the way we represent the arc. All right. And we do different de dependency formalisms. Um, different people might um, say, okay, but we need additional constraints. And um, I will mention universal dependencies uh, in a moment, uh, but depending on what constraints you take, you might put restrictions on uh, these structures over here and uh, very common restrictions to place on this directed graph is that it has to um, satisfy the following constraints. That there should be a single designated root node that has no incoming arcs. Um, that with the exception of the root node, each vertex has exactly one incoming arc and that there is a unique path from the root node to each vertex uh, in, uh, in our set of vertices. All of this together is to say that each word, word 
has a single head. So you cannot have two arcs pointing to a single word. Although um, uh, from a single word, you can have two un outgoing arcs, right? Um, that should be immediately clear if you think about verbs, which usually have subjects and objects, right? So verb will be a head word for whatever are the subjects and objects. Uh, uh, so there will be two outgoing arcs from the verb, but um, the subject and object will have only uh, one ingoing arc. All right, so each work has a single head. Uh, the dependency structure is connected. And there is a single root node for which one can follow a unique directed path to each words uh, in, a, in a sentence. Okay, so this is just a formal way of defining what the dependency tree is. We have defined a graph, what are the vertices, what are the arcs, and uh, we have put some restrictions on that, um, on that graph to be able to have uh, these uh, properties. Um, there is another thing to worth mentioning when we talk about restrictions, and that's the, uh, the concept of projectivity. Um, an arc from a head to a dependent is said to be projective if there is a path from the head to every word that lies between the head and the dependent in the sentence. And then dependency tree is uh, projective if every single one of the arcs uh, is projective. One way to find this immediately by just looking at the dependency parse tree is to see whether you have uh, these arcs that cross uh, each other. And um, uh, if that happens, then the tree is not projective. So only if all of the arcs are such, when you put them above the words, are such that they do not cross each other, uh, then you will have a projective tree. And uh, I'm mentioning this because sometimes we will assume or to say that, yeah, tree is a projective, but uh, in reality, there are many valid linguistic constructions which lead to non-projective trees. So like in this sentence here, JetBlue canceled our flight this morning, which was already uh, late, where now these two uh, arcs are crossing each other. Um, this has some concerns later on. Um, if dependency tree bank is automatically derived from a phrase-based uh, tree bank. So we had someone had annotated constituency parse trees and you figured, well, I could use this annotation to derive dependency parse trees. Uh, by finding these heads and dependents, um, then you will have only no, uh, trees that are projective. So if you see a tree that's non-projective, then um, you will uh, incorrectly represent it as projective tree while it's not. And most widely used families of parsing, uh, widely used families for, of parsing algorithms assume that the trees are projective. So they have they make mistakes when the trees are non-projective because they will give a projective parse tree uh, for uh, for a given sentence that should have non-projective parse tree. And there are ways to how to deal with that. Some people are just like, okay, it is what it is. We accept this error, and therefore our parser uh, is uh, this much correct. Um, others might do some post-processing steps to correct it, um, uh, and so on. So yeah, know that um, we are also making an assumption about our graphs, uh, namely that we will have projective trees, um, which comes from the arcs having certain property, uh, but this might not be, um, it is not the ideal assumption to make. Okay, so now, um, there were different, you know, I mentioned, I keep mentioning people, different people have, might have different ideas of what, how, how dependency should be, you know, exactly defined. How do we say we should put an arc between two words? Uh, you know, we have seen multiple times that in linguistics, there aren't exactly uh, agreements on certain things. And uh, this is the case also with the uh, what makes up a dependencies, like which words should be connected and which should not, and how the label should be described, how the arc should be described, excuse me. But today, what if you are deciding to do 
anything related to dependency policy, you will likely uh, use formalisms that are described in the Universal Dependencies Project. This project is an open community effort to un annotate dependencies over hundreds of languages currently, 130, I think, and they provide an inventory of 37 dependency relations and over 200 uh, tree banks, meaning uh, 200 data sets that are annotated with uh, dependency parsers. And their general philosophy is, in their own words, to provide a universal inventory of categories and guidelines to facilitate consistent annotation of similar constructions across languages by allowing language-specific extensions when necessary. So this is a screenshot from, um, from their uh, web page. And um, if you, you know, um, th th this is a classic example of how to show uh, dependency structures. Here uh, you can see the similarities between these structures across these uh, four different uh, languages. I also want to emphasize that this is one of the most, you know, open and multilingual projects we have in our community, but it still covers 130 languages. And I keep repeating that there are over 7,000 languages in the world. So even with the, you know, the most, uh, the richest uh, multilingual projects, we still have these massive limits of which languages are actually computationally uh, accessible. So that's something we have in mind. And uh, I think to this day, people are for their own languages that are not included, thinking about how can we annotate dependencies for my language, given these uh, schemas that are outlined in universal dependencies. And if that's something interesting to you, you should definitely uh, check it out because it's still very much so ongoing project. Anyone who does any kind of linguistics annotations, very often people will start with dependencies um, because this allows you to uh, tell your annotators how to uh, um, annotate spans such that they agree between each other. If you tell them, well, annotate whatever is under, you know, dependent on a verb and you give them dependency structure, then all they need to click are the dependence of the head, uh, uh, excuse me, dependence of the word in the dependency tree. So for example, um, just recently there has been released a new data set for named entity recognition in new languages. And they started with, again, dependency uh, structures from universal dependencies to tell their annotators now based on dependency structures, annotate named entities here. And this helps to have higher agreement between your annotators. So massively important, universal dependencies. You will keep seeing it uh, everywhere. And fun fact that, you know, uh, last year in our conferences, we have this uh, test of time awards and uh, this work, universal dependency annotation for multilingual parsing has received it uh, after 10 years after it has been originally released, really demonstrating that uh, even community says that yes, even to this date, this is still uh, an important idea. Okay, so this is our setup for dependency parsing. I will now go over algorithms for how to produce these dependency parser, uh, dependency parse trees. And we'll finish with uh, how to evaluate dependencies. Um, and as I said, I will use uh, Vivex slides just because, um, yeah, they are quite uh, useful for what I want to say here and have visualizations which are hard to produce. So definitely save me some time. Okay, any questions so far? Oh, yes, please. No, just one word. That's one of the conditions on, in the formalism. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, I don't know how exactly what, actually, I have a demo. So why don't we look what the state of the art model thinks about this one? Um, you would definitely have one root. That's I'm 100% sure. But uh, I think here you would probably pick the first one as your, my guess, the first one would be the 
main uh, the root, and then the second verb will be connected to the first one through coordination end. Um, is is my guess. Um, but can you can you repeat the sentence? Oops. Goes to a shop. Okay. Uh, let's see. They are not showed. Sorry, second. Uh, the two verbs goes. The first goes and the second goes are connected. By the conjunction. Uh, yeah, exactly. Here they are not visualizing uh, what the root is, uh, but I think it's um, easy to guess that it goes then uh, over over here. I don't know why they are visualizing. Maybe they don't deem it um, important, but. Yeah, so you would have goes being the root here, and then uh, it is connected uh, with the other reference, uh, other mention of goes with the conjunction, and conjunction is always like when you have end something else. Yeah. But yeah, this is a great example of, um, yeah, there is how how do we how do we decide what, how where to put the root and. What to do once we made that decision? What do we do with this next thing? Like how to connect it? This is how these formalisms came about. Someone had to decide, yes, this is how we are going to go uh, about this. And someone else might have, have their other ideas. And this is why we have different, you know, there is dependency grammar, there is dependency parsing, but there isn't like a single dependency formalism. And you can uh, have your own ideas and annotate your own tree back with your um with your uh you know uh formalism and i think to some extent that's what was happening also before in nlp more and now everyone wants more universal things because then we can do a bunch of things building off each other yes please uh, the project limiting informed by i think like structure like something yeah um, or, or different structure from one actually to the uh, again, whenever there is a more free word uh, order, you will have more um, more um, non-projectivity. Um, but also, it were like I gave an example of German, which has very fixed. Um, at least my experience with that is that the word must come, must appear at certain positions. Um, there, you you might also have uh, this issue. So definitely. Um, not just the freer word uh, order, but uh, whatever kind of specialized structure, grammatical structures and how we place words in a sentence uh, affect projectivity. Yeah, so it's a, that's what I wanted to emphasize. It's not like this weird, it, it, like th these examples where we have non-projectivity is not like a super rare, um, but we still kind of, it's a hard thing to deal with computationally. So. A lot of these things are going to assume everything is projective and then try to fix it up later. OK, is is that clear? All right, so um, we I said we are going to look into an algorithm, two algorithms for uh, for uh, dependency parsing, for creating these parses given a sentence. And first uh, algorithm we are going to look into is called transition-based parsing, which is a simple, uh, greedy, discriminative parser that executes a sequence of actions as we go left to the right uh, over the sentence uh, that updates something called parse state, which I will define now. So the parse state uh, is an object that consists of three things. Um, it consists of a buffer that will have input words. And as we are making these uh, decisions, actions over what to do, uh, some of the input words will be placed somewhere else. So the, the number of words, input words we have in our buffer is gonna become smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's always going to be in the same order it came. Basically, um, we, we we are kind of removing the beginning where the the words that came first and then uh you know step by step we are coming to the end of the sentence 
a step uh, will be uh, will have top elements representing the next words that will be connected with the dependency edge. So basically, uh, before we decide to do an action, we are going to look at what are the top two words in our stack. And given our dependency formalism, should we connect these two words? So um, I'll come to that in just a moment. Um, and then we'll have a set of all dependency edges that have been created so far. Uh, this will become way clearer when we go over the example, how this buffer stack and action set is changing. Uh, but for now, you need to know that the parse state is determined by these three objects. And then we'll have actions. Actions are going to operate on this parse state, which is, again, uh, combined from three different things. And it's going to produce the next state. Next state being a new state for uh, buffer, stack, and the action set. And if you know a lot about compiler, this is going to behave like shift and reduce and shift and reduce parser. Um, but with programming languages, everything is nicer because there is no ambiguity. Um, actions are going to shift move, uh, moves. Uh, um, excuse me. One of the action, actions will be to move a word from the buffer to the stack. And we will have different kinds of reduce actions that will create those dependency edges. Again, might be not super clear exactly what I'm telling you right now. It will become clearer when we go over an example. Um, important to know is that there are different kinds of transition systems uh, where uh, behavior is defined by the set of actions. For our transition-based dependency parsing, we are going to uh, embrace the ARC standard transition system, which has only three actions shift, left arc, and right arc, which we're going to see in a moment. OK, so I'm going to give you a, like an abstraction of the steps we are doing, and then we are going to work over an example. So we said that the parse state has a stack, which we'll call, call sigma. It has a buffer. And this buffer, we, are gonna, we can represent um, as this is the first uh, the first element of the buffer, wi. Then we have this, um, how do you call the symbol? Pipe, pipe symbol. And beta being the rest of the buffer. This uh, notation over here says we have our stack. Uh, and then comes uh, the first word, first word in the buffer, and then the rest of the buffer and the um, set of actions, a set of dependency relations we have accumulated so far. Um, when we do the shift operation, um, we are going to take whatever was the first element of the buffer, and that's going to become, um, excuse me, the last uh, element at the top of our stack. So shift, this is the original state we have, is going to do this, where this first element that was in a buffer previously is now the top element of the stack. That's what the shift operation is going to do. All right, and um, you, you will see this notation. So this is how we have represented our state before. We have our uh, stack, and then we had the first element of the buffer, and then the rest of the buffer. And now when we did the shift operation, we have stack and the first, uh, the last element of the stack being the uh, WI, and then we have a uh, buffer, the remaining, what, whatever is remaining in the buffer and the set of dependency relations. Um, honestly, not terribly important that you use this notation, but since it's here, I, I just wanted to explain. And um, you sh the colors are also, kind of suggestive for what's uh, part of the stack and what's part of the uh, buffer. All right, now left arc relation. With left arc relation, we are going to look at the, excuse me, uh, we are going to have some top two elements in our stack, wi and wj. And uh, with this operation, what we are going to do is 
we are going to put a dependency arc between these two where uh, one of these will be head and the other one will be um, the dependent. And here specifically, this word is gonna be head and this one is gonna be dependent. Therefore, this is, you can imagine a left arc going from WJ to WI. I said we are going to represent relations as the pair of words, right? And I said that the first word is gonna be head. So how these words are placed in which order is extremely important because if we had the other order, we would say that WI is the head and WJ is dependent and we would have actually right arc, not the left arc. So order, massively important because we have a directed graph and we do not have symmetric relations. So one more time with the left arc corporation, we take the top two words uh, at the stack, WI and WJ, and we um, have on the side um, some rules for which words should be uh, dependent on each other. And we decide, uh -huh, this is an example where WJ and WI have grammatical relation between them. Let's say WJ is our verb and WI is our subject. And we wanna place the left arc between them. And we are gonna do that by placing in our set of dependencies relations, this new relation we have just um, you know, figured out. Here we would have um, uh, M subject or subject, and then a uh, verb and followed by the, uh, the noun that's the subject. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to push back the head, so WJ at the top of the stack because that word can still be ahead of some other word, whereas the dependent can be dependent only uh, once, okay? So you, uh, you once you did the, 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 you know, recorded what kind of relations there are between W and WJ, and you have produced the left arc, you're gonna place the WJ back to the stack. Now, right arc is very similar, except that we look at the top two words in a stack, WI, WJ, and instead of making a left arc, we are gonna make right arc. So what's gonna be a head word here? Sorry, WI, exactly. So we are placing a right arc between these two words. So you can imagine an arc that goes from left to right, which is, um, it's kind of <laughs> a little mind bending for sure. Um, so you place an edge from WI to WJ, and uh, you know whatever is the dependency label you should place here. Very common type of this relation is verb to, um, to um, excuse me, object. Object very commonly comes in English after the verb. Uh, and when you do that, again, you're gonna push whatever is your head word to the top of your stack, which is now WI. And notice how here the relation is W, I, W, J, where before we had W, J, W, uh, w I. So again, the order which we place these words uh, is important because that tells us where the arc is going from. All right, so this is a description of the operations we are gonna do. Any questions about shift, left arc and right arc? Okay, very well. We're now gonna see an example where I think this is gonna then really uh, land. Um, we are going to have this example, the tabby cat scratch the couch. And I, I wanna show you again, go back to that demo I had um, here. Uh, this is an example of automatically produced dependency parse tree for this sentence. I do wanna mention immediately, it does have a mistake, which we'll see just in a second. Uh, all the all the arcs make sense, it, but not all the labels. Um, however, this is based. You you should have in mind this is what we are trying to produce with the uh, this uh, this uh, procedure. Okay. So, the first thing we are going to do is place all the input words in the buffer. So the tabby cat scratched the couch. They're all which. 
obviously we, it means that we have tokenized the sentencing uh, words as well. The stack will start only with root and the set of dependencies will gonna be uh, empty. Uh, first operation uh, we are gonna do is gonna be um, is gonna be shift operation. So remember, we have three options for which kind of actions we are gonna do: shift, left arc, or right arc. Why can't we use left or right arc right now? Exactly, the stack is empty, and we need two words in a stack. So until we have um, um, two of them, we are uh, not gonna not gonna do anything. Here uh, we have root and the. Uh, I think it's easy to imagine that there isn't any kind of uh, dependency relation over here that we don't want to start uh, the thing with the uh, with the error root. But yeah, that's maybe not as convincing. I should find you exact um, from universal dependencies. It would be nice here if I have um, a rule for how to connect with the root, which is the the least intuitive, I would say. So let's say for now that. The rule is that only the main verb, which is the predicate, can be connected to root. And given that uh, the is the determiner, not the verb, we know we don't want to make any uh, arc between these two words. OK, now we have, um, again, uh, here we have uh, shifted the tabby to the stack. Um, and now we have this parse, uh, parse, um, parse state. We have root the tabby cat in our, um, in our, uh, stack. And we can look into this, like this gives away what kind of action we're going to do. Um, but, um, let's see why. So here we have tabby and cat. Can you tell me what is tabby grammatically to a cat here? Yes, it's an adjective, right? And if you go to um, universal dependencies and you have read the entirety of universal dependencies, you would know, okay, there is a uh, mod label that's adjectival modifier. And it says that that's, you should label that, put that arc and um, label it with a mod if uh, you have uh, an adjective that's modifying the noun, which is exactly the situation we have. We have a noun cat and we have an adjective tabby. So now after, you know, following the, uh, our, our uh, formalism, we know we should be connecting these two words. So we are gonna do that. And we also know that uh, cat should be head and that the tabby is a modifier or dependent. Therefore, the arc should go from cat to uh, tabby. And therefore, we are doing left arc action, not right arc. So we decided to apply left arc. And what we need to do is uh, return uh, one of these words to uh, the stack. Which word goes back to the stack? Cat. Cat goes back to the stack because it's a head word and it can behave as a head of another word. So we need to keep it in the stack. All righty. Besides uh, doing that, we also need to record which kind of dependency arc we have uh, just realized with this operation, which is a mod between cat and tabby. Remember the order matters. Okay, so now we have the cat as our um, as our uh, two top uh, words in a stack, and um, I wish I wish we didn't give you away the the actions because I want to keep asking you which actions uh, you would do here. Um, but uh, we have two these two words the, uh, in the stack, the and cat, and we need to decide whether we need to put an arc between them. Um, can you tell me, um, should we put an arc between them and why? One answer is given away in the, in, in the slide, so <laughs> feel free to just uh, say it out loud. Yeah. 
So is the article that's used as a different name for the tag? Exactly. That's right. So um, now, given what you just said, can you also said, uh, say uh, which word is dependent and which one is the uh, head and therefore which kind of action we should take? That is the meaning. Left arc, exactly. So we have an arrow that will go from cat to the, therefore we are putting left arc between them. And uh, as was just said, the type of label we wanna have here is determiner. Okay, so again, we need to record that we have determiner, head uh, word goes first, cat, and then the, the, the dependent, which is the. And we need to do one final thing and that's Yes, put the head a word back to the uh, to the stack, which is for us cat. Okay, now we have uh, root and cat. Again, uh, let's say that we are not gonna place root to anything except the main verb. Cat is not the main verb. So what are we gonna do here? Shift, yeah. We are not gonna put any kind of edge between these two. So we are shifting away. Watch that, what does shift mean? What's gonna happen? Exactly, scratch goes uh, to the top of the, uh, the, the stack. All right, so now uh, this is just repeating the last uh, st step over here. So just repeating it here because we need more space. We have in our stack root cat scratch and buffer the couch. So we look again at the top two words in our uh, stack, which are cat and scratch. Can anyone tell me what do you think will happen next and why? Maybe you can raise a hand just because it's a lot of words. So it's overlapping if you speak at the same time. Yes, please. Perfect. That's exactly what we are gonna do. So Scratch uh, and CAD are, have a dependency relation between them. Namely, cat is the subject of the word of scratch. So we are doing the left arc um, action here. We are gonna put uh, uh, our new relation in the set of dependencies. So subject scratch cat is um, in the set of dependencies. And the final thing is to take the head uh, word and put it back on the stack, which is scratch. So it goes back to the stack. Okay, so now we have root and scratch in our uh, in our um, um, stack. So here it says shift, although I I just don't know like what the exact rule is for dealing with the root. So um, if we had followed what I told you to put the dependency between the root and the main verb, we should have placed it. But now we are not going to do that. So. Sorry, I don't know what the, how exactly we decide to what to do with uh, if root is involved in the top two words uh, in a uh, in a stack. So here again, we are going to do the uh, shift action, meaning we are going to put the um, at the top of the scratch, and um, you know uh, it's nothing. Maybe you don't know what you would do with this, and um, you would be right that there is no relation between them. Therefore, we are going to put um, do another shift action and put the couch at the top of the uh, stack. Now the buffer now is becoming became empty, and that's getting close to the end of the whole procedure. To really end, we also need to have only a uh, 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 root, I believe, in the in the um, stack. And if that's true, I think then the rule is that you need to have two words that are not root at the top of your stack is my guess. Uh, and you deal with the root only at the end. Okay, so here we look at the top two words, the and couch, just as we had before, the is uh, a determiner of the word couch. Uh, so we are gonna have uh, left arc relation here. We're going to pl place this dependency in a set of dependency. We're going to put the head word at the top of the uh, at, at the top of the stack. Top two words are scratched and couch. What are we going to do with them? Right arc and the relation will be object. That's amazing. Yes, we'll have scratched and couch. 
Um, couch is the object of scratch, therefore we place that relation in our set of dependencies, head word scratch goes back to the stack, right? And you see how we had scratch being two uh, appearing twice as a head word. And now um, uh, here we have as a final thing, uh, root and scratched, and uh, we are gonna place root to be the, uh, uh, pointing to the main word, which is scratch. So yeah, I don't exactly know how we deal with the root. I, I'll, I'll specify that on Monday when we meet again, uh, because here it's kind of confusing that when we had it here, we didn't combine them, right? But at the end we did combine them. Um, okay, so whenever, so now we have as our stack, just the root and as our buffer, we have nothing. And that's um that's a place where we stop with our parsing. And in the end, we have this set of dependencies and that's it, right? Like now we can draw the arc and show the visualizations that I have uh, been showing you because all you need to show them is relations between uh, words. Questions is, I feel like I get a feeling that you are kind of okay with that, although have a presence in the middle when I ask um, like um, to tell me what kind of relations. So um, everyone else, is, is it clear? How are we doing this? Okay, quite a few nods. So uh, that's that's great. All right, so we are gonna just go over a um, few properties of this uh, algorithm. And we are also going to um, see how we can model model this, um, deciding which actions to do without having like knowledge about a priori about like we have all a possible example. So we just need to look up whether these could be and uh, subject of a verb, for example. Okay, so um, we'll first go over, we, we have covered the example, but this will go give you the full, you know, uh, specification of the algorithm, abstract away such that you can apply it to whatever you want. So your input will be a tokenized sentence and you will have a, parse state, initial parse state being, um, it's always gonna consist of a stack, buffer, and uh, a set of actions. So this is what these three lists are representing. And your initial parse state is gonna consist of a stack that has only root uh, as part of it. Uh, buffer will be all the words in your input and the set of dependencies is gonna be empty. And then, while your state, uh, you will loop until you reach the final state, which is a state where you have this, you have root in the stack and buffer is being empty. Until you reach that state, you are going to uh, do the following. You are going to find the best action to do for that state. And when you apply that action, the stack buffer and set of dependencies is gonna change. And therefore you are going to get uh, a new state when you apply the action you decided on onto a current state. Uh, we have seen that actions are very limited. You have only shift or left or arc or uh, labeled uh, right arc. Um, and so when I was showing you an example, I was saying, okay, you, you are the linguist and you have this, you know, uh, the whole specification, and then you are trying to decide which action to take given everything you know about these dependencies. Here we'll actually have a machine learning approach that decides which action to do next as a classifier. So given our current state, the classifier will decide, well, we should be doing this uh, action uh, next, and then we are gonna apply that action to produce the new state uh, and so on until we reach the uh, final set date. And issue here that this is a greedy algorithm. Once it takes an action, it does not uh, go back. And we know that that's not always uh, ideal, right? Okay, so this was just repeating what we have seen with an example, but in a more you know abstract uh, form. And let's talk a little bit more about uh, this step where the classifier needs to decide 
which action to uh, take next. Um, so we, this can then obviously be framed as a, a multi-class classification problem. And yeah, maybe we can talk a little bit about what kind of model would you build if you are um, training a classifier that has um, that needs to give in a part state, decide what's the next state. What's the input to that classifier? What kind of algorithm would you use? Um, yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts. Oh, no, that'll give me one away. Okay, uh, just to remind you what the, um, I think, let me scroll here. Um, So when you were deciding on the actions, what you have been seeing is stack and buffer, right? And you know what are possible um, classes for action. So um, what you don't need to fully specify features, but what does the model needs to know? Like what kind of information we must give it to make an action? Or in other words, what did you use to make an action? State, right? And state is built off which components? Stack and buffer. So that's definitely something we need to give to our model to be able to predict which action to take next. Okay, so how can we represent stack and buffer? What 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 is in the stack and buffer? Sequences of uh, words, yeah. So ideas, how do we represent words? Yes. Uh, sorry, second. Yeah, grammatical grammatical rules. Uh, one feature could be, yes, uh, if you are opting out for feature-based approach uh, with manually designed feature, knowing what kind of part part of speech tag, each one of the words in our stack has is definitely important. Knowing that there is a verb and a noun gives us a plethora of option, while if you have the terminal and a verb, not, likely not gonna connect two of those. Very good. What else is important? Yeah, so we should probably begin in them in a in a certain uh, order. Um, any maybe like properties of words, you you know, like we talked about embeddings and maybe knowing a little bit about semantics of the word could be also uh, helpful. But in any case, um, here. Um, you. you you more or less specified it. So we have stack, we have buffer, and we need to decide what to do with it. So we need to give what's in the buffer, we need to give what's in the stack. In the stack and buffer are words. So we need to give some features of those words that are currently in stack and buffer. And then based on those features, the model uh, needs to predict um, uh, what to do next. So for example, uh, useful features uh, that have been mentioned are part of uh, speech uh, text, and uh, also the positions of the words on the stack and the buffer, uh, and so on. Um, so before, now in, you know, we in the first part of the course, we talked a lot about neural networks. So um, we kind of maybe now know that these things, although part of speech tag is a useful feature, maybe the model on its own can figure out that that's useful feature without us explicitly say so. So maybe we can just, um, if you are working with a neural classifier, maybe we can represent each one of these words with their word embeddings and then uh, give them uh, to a model and the model can uh, decide on whatever class we should, uh, of, you know, it's a three class classification uh, that decides whether we'll apply shift or left arc or right arc. Before uh, before neural networks, uh, then we would have something like a one hot vector representing the uh, the fact that second element of the stack is the cat, or um, 
uh, or second element on a stack is a noun. So each dimension, when we have a specific meaning, we have manually assigned to that dimension in that vector. And then we will just put one or zero, depending on whether that feature, such as uh, whether a second element of the stack is a cat, appeared or not. And now if the vocabulary is 10,000 of words, to represent that one information, and you would have this uh, 10,000 dimensional vector. So this becomes uh, very quickly an enormous vector, which is quite sparse, which we have learned in the first part of this course that it's not great. Like for some reason, computational approaches like short, like 50, 300, 700 dimensional vectors that are dense, that don't have zeros. Um, um, and hence, that's why things work better with uh, neural uh, dependency parsers, which is something you would likely use uh, today. All right, so um, you can also, um, excuse me. Um, oh, I'm a little bit lost in errors, uh, errors. Okay, um, there, there was a stage with uh, neural network development where we would also combine these, um, um, manually designed features with learned features. And that um, is not something we would call end-to-end -end approach. End-to-end -end approach is when the model learns everything from scratch. So there was a phase where we would uh, give word embeddings as input, but also maybe information about part of speech tags of these words, and that would yield some improvements. But then as time went, end-to-end uh, -end approach and became um, state of the art like they for for a couple of years researchers wanted to see whether you can have fully um end-to-end -end approach to to these things and uh, i think by now we all believe that's possible uh in terms of the classifier you could use whatever uh such as a two two layer neural uh network um uh, you would um concatenate the embeddings from the stack buffer and uh, uh, another information that you had so far, you, such as which are the relations you have already um, recorded. And here you need to, when you are concatenating things, when with neural networks, the next uh, layer is gonna be uh, a nonlinear transformation, meaning that you have a matrix whose one of the dimensions of this matrix is, um, will depend on the dimensions on the input vector. So here you just need to do a little bit of engineering that um, in the first uh, in the first step, you might have, um, ex uh, let, let me uh, say this point differently. The sizes of buffers and stacks are gonna be variable as we move, right? So here you probably need to set some maximum possible size of the stack and buffer and uh, if a buffer has only, let's say, two words, but maximally it could have six words, then you'll use some dummy vectors for the remaining four. Um, so just have that in mind. When you're concatenating vectors, you do need to do a little bit of um, careful design of what will happen um, in the subsequent layer where dimension of the linear transformation will be dependent on the uh, dimension of the input vector. And if we had some this representation wouldn't matter because uh, if, if we had variable number of words, but we sum their mean bendings, in the end, we end up with the one vector of the same dimension, right? Um, okay, these are some um, things we have covered, like Vivek mentions here, training, how we would train neural networks, but we have talked about that a lot. So for us, that's not super important. Um, and also have in mind that when you download a tree bank with dependency parsers, um, of course, uh, I, I mean, it goes without saying, uh, but we do need data to train our neural network, right? And luckily universal dependency gives us these 200 tree banks. Unless you work in a language that doesn't have a tree bank, then you got to create one to uh, approach uh, dependency parsing, neural dependency parsing uh, in this way. Um, and something to keep in mind is when you download your tree bank, it's not going to come in exact format you uh, you need. Uh, namely, you will have a sentence and you'll have a parse tree, but you need a um, set of actions to do. So you will need to do some processing of the data to turn the parse tree into 
these uh, sequences uh, that you can use for supervision to know at every step what you what kind of action in transition based dependency parser you had to do. So it won't be immediately given away to to you. Okay, and to do that, you will need to do you know uh, you will need to know about something called Oracle and how to go about this. You know, not go into details of that, and you can check Jurafsky and Martin for that. And of course, if you want to do that, you will start with someone's code. Like people have done this before. You don't need to start from scratch. Okay. Um, I have mentioned the uh, projectivity, right? Um, and uh, this uh, transition-based dependency parser is going to produce only projective trees. It can produce only projective trees. It doesn't have a chance to produce uh, non-projective trees. So if you have a sentence like the, the one we have seen, um, it's gonna, you are gonna predict, uh, you are gonna generate a projective tree for it when the correct tree should have been something different. It should have been a non-projective tree. So how to deal with that? And as I mentioned before, you can do nothing and just admit, yes, if you had this uh, kind of construction, my dependency parser will not be perfect for you. Um, you can change your, whole formalism to something that is uh, allowing uh, to deal with this um, situation. But if you have universal dependencies, you want to use them. Uh, you can do some post-processing -pro post steps to check uh, to, to fix uh, the edges. Uh, or you could use a graph-based parser where this actually doesn't matter. And that's what we are going to quickly go over uh, in the in the rest of this uh, lecture. But before we go into that, um, are there any questions about um, transition-based uh, dependency parsers? Nope. Okay. All right, so um, if not, um, uh, we, we won't go in as much detail into the alternative algorithm, which is graph-based uh, dependency parsing, because more or less you what you do here is say, oh, this, there is, it's a graph, and we know a lot about graphs in computer science, so why not do things, uh, um, you know, apply things we have uh, applied in other circumstances? So we'll quickly go over that, and then we're going to finish with how we evaluate dependency uh, parsers. All right. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, dependency trees are trees whose words are uh, notes, and every word in a sentence has to be reachable. And uh, from the root tree to every, you know, we, we need to be able to reach every word from the root of the tree. So this means that the dependency tree is a spanning tree over the words. Um, and the key idea of graph-based parsing is that we, if we have an input sentence, we should find the best uh, tree. And to do that, we should use a scoring function that we're gonna call shocker score. And the goal is gonna be to find, um, as, as we said, the best, uh, the best tree. So here, the best tree is denoted by T star. Uh, we are going to have argmax uh, optimization. So we are finding the uh, maximum tree uh, among all spanning trees for that sentence. So all possible spanning trees for a given sentence are denoted with G of S. And we are going to uh, do that by finding the tree that has the maximal score. And the issue is that trees can be arbitrarily large since sentences can be ar arbitrarily large. So the scoring scheme needs to account that. And to, to, to account for that, we use the edge factor model where the score for a tree is the sum of scores of all of its edges. So we make that assumption. So here score for a given tree uh, for a given sentence is the sum of over all of the edges in this tree and uh, the scores of those edges. Um, excuse me. So um, 
edge again is um, defined by the head and the dependent, and we also have dependency parsing is uh, needs to assign labels to the uh, the arcs, arrows, or edges, however we call them. So again, uh, the the thing that scores these edges can be any neural network you uh, like. And um, in 2017, Dozat and Manning trained two neural networks, one compute that computes the probability there is an edge for a word I toward a J, and another one that assigns a label to uh, an edge. So again, you can just approach this by representing head dependent uh, and um, and uh, and the label, and then deciding what what is gonna be the score for that label. And we know now about logits, so yeah, a normalized logits could be a score for an edge. Um, and given some, you know, we have found a way to score functions. Then we need to search over all the trees to find the highest scoring, uh, highest scoring one. And this is where our education in computer science comes in handy because this is a well studied problem of finding a max, uh, a maximum spanning tree, given that we already have uh, scores on the edges. So we use the neural network to find the scores, but then we have algorithms to find the best. Uh, uh, to, to find the, the, the best uh, tree, namely the one with the, which has the highest score defined by the sum over the scores of its edges. Here is one of the standard uh, solutions. Um, so he will, as I said, this, this is it about graph-based uh, approach. It's um, super straightforward, um, given that we just need to know the Edge, uh, the scores for the edges and that we can use um, any kind of classifier we like that we find suitable for, you know, um, predicting a score for a given edge. And uh, actually here, the situation is very easier because we don't have a sequence of, you know, words in a stack and buffer. Rather, we always have a one head, one dependent and a label. So the classification, I mean, the scoring problem becomes um, simpler. Um, in terms of complexity of these two approaches, grass-based parsing is quadratic in input length, where the transition-based is linear in sentence length. So yeah, we're gonna like uh, transition-based more. If you have an enormous corpus of data, we would like to apply dependency parse on. So if you do anything uh, to analyze data, this, uh, th this makes uh, a big difference. Uh, however, graph-based parsing can produce non-projective parse trees. So if you work in a language where projectivity, the, the assumption that the that the arcs are, and the tree is going to be projective is really strong, then you're better off with the graph-based graph uh, parsing. Um, as always, projectivity, not a big issue for uh, English, uh, unlike for other languages. And graph-based parsings can be better on dependency arc where the head is far from uh, dependent uh, as well. So if we have languages that I keep mentioning where this can happen, again, you will you might have a better chance with graph-based parsers. In the end, what we are doing is empirical, right? So if you didn't need to find the best parser, you might have some intuitions about your language, and therefore you might have intuition of which one of these two approaches would be better. Um, if you have intuition that, well, these um, my words are never super far away from each other. I don't have non-projective structures very often, but I know that transition-based uh, dependency parser, uh, parser is way faster than you you hope that will, it really will be. But you will all, you, you should always evaluate the two approaches to uh, to make informed decision, right? Okay, but that brings me to, if you're gonna compare two algorithms, what is the point of evaluation? What's the number where, which tells us that one is the better than the other? And uh, we are gonna wrap with the evaluation of uh, dependency uh, parsers, which is not gonna be anything difficult or way different than what we have seen uh, in certain situation before, but still slightly uh, different. Um, Again, evaluation will assume we have annotated trees. So we do need to have a tree bank where we have sentences put together with a dependency 
uh, parses. And the goal of our evaluation is to say, well, how uh, different is the arcs I placed on uh, the uh, between words from uh, what the human annotator expert has said uh, should uh, be connected. And also uh, there is another thing here, like the labels. Um, are maybe I have placed the right arcs, but I I just didn't know the label that I should place between them, which are two separate issues that might happen. Which means that we are going to have two uh, two different scoring schemes. We are going to have unlabeled attachment score where we do not uh, care about the labels. We just want to see can we put the right edges between words, and the labeled attachment score where we care about whether not only whether we place the right arrows, uh, right edges between the words but also whether the label we have placed on the edge is correct. All right, so um, here is the, the same sentence we have seen before. The tabby has scratched the couch. Uh, we are going to denote the uh, dependent and head by using the integers above the uh, this uh, each one of these words. So here um, uh, we have, let me go here. Uh, scratch uh, is going to be uh, a head. Um, excuse me, the, the head the, is going to have the relation with the root and root will have this uh, special index zero. So uh, the head that points to scratch uh, has an index zero. Uh, and then um, the, the dependent, um, Sorry, I, I misread this. So let, let me go over this again. Uh, here we have just one, two, three, four, five, six for our six words. Uh, and then for each one of them, we are noting what is the head uh, of that uh, word. So for scratched, uh, the, uh, the root is the head word. So we have zero. Cat and couch, we see that scratched is uh, the head for those two words. And these are the, its a dependence. So here we have four because uh, that's the index of the um of the word scratch. Um, we have all the other relations and this is our goal dependency parse. Now here we have our generated uh, parse. And the first thing we are gonna check is number of correct dependencies uh, over the number of dependencies in general. And if you would now compare these rows, one, three, and here one, two, they're different, right? So this is wrong. Uh, here we have two, three, and here we have two, four, that's also wrong. But the rest of them are correct. We have three, four, three, four, four, zero, four, zero, five, six, five, six, and six, uh, four. So the number, uh, the accuracy is gonna be, um, uh, we have six dependencies, uh, I think in total, is that right? Yes, we have six dependencies, but four of them are correct. So the unlabeled attachment score is gonna be 66. Okay. Now, uh, three label edges are incorrect. Uh, here we have uh, this, uh, sh here we have, um, uh, let me just check which one are the wrong. Here we have object and subject, different. Um, a modifier and object, different. Um, I'm confused with why this row is highlighted when that's uh, just the um, same label, but different. Uh, different heads. Um, so yeah, here we are highlighting e if uh, either we have the wrong head or we have the wrong label. If one of these two things happen, we say uh, that we have incorrect decision. So we have uh, three correct decisions and six one that are not correct. So labeled attachment score is going to be 50%. Uh, uh, so yeah, this is how we evaluate the dependency parsers. We have two measurements, labeled and unlabeled attachment score. Unlabeled attachment scores checks the uh, how many of the dependencies are um, correct in a sense of whether we have predicted the correct head for uh, each one of the words. And the labeled uh, attachment scores checks that, but also whether the label we have assigned to uh, the relation uh, is correct. All right, so that's it. Uh, we are going to finish here. And then next week, we are going to move away from parsing into semantics. <laughs>